thanks to all of you for attending today's webinar uh, with Eugene Litvak on how we can optimize patient flow despite the current demand on our resources caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, there is a need for hospitals to continuously assess and improve operational efficiency and ensure that non-COVID patients' needs are being met. Uh, this is a huge challenge, but there are tools that can help us to tackle it. So we are very grateful to have Dr. Eugene Litvak here uh, to help us make sense of these challenges. And just to give a bit of background on um, uh, Eugene, uh, Eugene is president and CEO of the Nonprofit Institute for Healthcare Optimization. He is also an adjunct professor in operations management in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, where he teaches the course Operations Management in Service Delivery Organizations. Dr. Litvak is an author of more than 60 publications in the areas of operations management in healthcare and delivery. Uh, in healthcare delivery organizations. He was the editor of the Joint Commission's patient flow books called Managing Patient Flow in Hospitals, Strategies and Solutions, second edition, and Optimizing Patient Flow, Advanced Strategies for Managing Variability to Enhance Access, Quality and Safety, as well as the leader of the organization's first patient flow seminars. Uh, since 1995, he has led the development and practical application of innovative, innovative approaches for managing patient flow variability uh, for cost reduction and quality improvement in healthcare delivery systems. Application of these approaches has resulted in significant quality improvement and multi-million dollar improvements in the margins for every hospital that has applied them. He is also principal investigator in many hospital and hospital systems operations improvement projects. These include CMS-sponsored initiative Partners Partnership for Patients in New Jersey and Nationwide Patient Flow Initiative in Scotland. So uh, I'm really grateful to have you here, Eugene. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and just for all of our attendees, if you have any questions for Eugene, I will um, ask you just to pop them in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screens. And at the end, we'll have a few minutes to go through the questions. Um, and just before Eugene starts, I think Peter might want to say a couple of words. Peter uh, is the CEO of ISQA. Uh, thanks, Katrina. I just wanted to have a special welcome to Eugene, uh, who I've known since my days at IHI uh, in 2005 when we started working together. And Eugene also came to Great Ormond Street when I was there to look at our flow there. So the reason for this uh, presentation right now is because I think that the, the theories that Eugene's going to be talking about, about managing flow through managing variability, uh, are very applicable now in the COVID era. So that is the reason. So thank you very much, Eugene, and over to you. Yeah, thank you very much for introduction. And Peter, thank you for reminding me about all good times. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to talk today at the uh, uh, ISQ. And uh, we work with Peter on, uh, uh, at Great Ormond Street Hospital, as he mentioned, and he achieved. I, I, I'm not presenting those results because I don't want to steal the thunder. He, he, he really achieved uh, a lot of important things there. So with that, let me start about ma talking about managing variability in patient flow. You have all slides, or you will have all slides, but I want to tell you that I'm going to skip a few slides. Uh, I put them just uh, for your information. So with that, let me start. And we are going, most of the presentation is going to be about pre-pandemic. So here is uh, one of the most important reports of the Institute of Medicine in the United States, which is now National Academy of Medicine. They studied uh, what is going on with healthcare delivery in the US, they found that it is ineffective, inefficient, provides inadequate safety, insufficient patient centeredness, inadequate timeliness of care. Uh, uh, and <laughs> I would say everything else seemed to be fine. So uh, clearly the system is not good. And this report uh, started uh, with another report there as humans started the movement of creating a quality, uh, quality of care uh, representatives that like people who are taking care of quality of care at hospitals and outside of the hospital. They started practical quality of care movement. Uh, here another uh, uh, 
I am report that I would strongly recommend you to read. Uh, that's one of the best Institute of Medicine report. And here is another one. So with that, let me ask, can we achieve the quality of care without addressing variability in patient flow? Is it realistic? So I would like to be challenged uh, on this question and try to defend uh, this position that we cannot. Now, imagine that we have a choice to fly Boeing 37 or Boeing 747. Uh, we need to fly 300 passengers. Uh, Boeing 737 has only 200 seats. Boeing 747 has uh, 400 seats. So one of them ha has not enough seats, another have extra seats. Which one should we choose? And the choice is very difficult. Uh, uh, the 737, the passengers would have to sit in the aisle and uh, atten uh, 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 flight attendant should jump over. That would not be safe. In a 747, then we would waste money because it would be 100 uh, open uh, seats, which is pretty expensive. Which one should we choose? So the right question is not what do we have to choose, but why do we have this scenario? And frequently in healthcare, we forget about where the problem stems from, and we are trying just to resolve it. So that is very important to understand why do we have this problem in the first place before we are trying to solve it. So let me uh, mention just four major problems in uh, healthcare delivery. It's patient safety, nurse uh, understaffing or overloading, which is uh, two sides of the same coin. ED diversion or uh, overcrowding, which limits access to care. S in some places, some countries, some states in the United States, ED diversions are not allowed. We are not allowed to divert the ambulances if they come to the hospital, but that means that the hospital is overcrowded. Nowadays, during the pandemic, ED overcrowding is the worst enemy because that's a source of infection. So one of my ED colleagues, uh, distinguished physician, uh, Dr. Peter Vichella, he said that uh, given the pandemic, we have to have no weight ED. And, and I agree with that. The next challenge is high cost. So uh, my point is that addressing variability is not sufficient, but absolutely necessary to resolve those issues. As long as we have variability, we are going to have those problems. So that's a real hospital. Uh, I cannot name it and I cannot tell you which hospital is that because the information is proprietary. I don't have even numbers on the access. Uh, why I call it not my hospital because none of the hospitals want to acknowledge that they have that pattern. And yet, if you look at the pattern at your hospitals, you will see exactly the same. How high could be those peaks and valleys? If the hospital is well managed, lucky, those peaks and valleys could be 10, 15% uh, up, 10, 15% down. That would make a difference between two neighboring days of about 25, maybe 30%. If the hospital is not well managed, I can tell you I've seen up to 80 plus percent, the difference in bed occupancy between uh, two neighboring days. So census is bad occupants in terms of terminology. Now, what's, what is the problem with that? Nobody, unlike many, many, maybe dozens, dozens years ago, we, uh, are not, uh, uh, we cannot afford staffing at the peak. Look at the red dashed line. That's how we used to staff 20, 30, maybe 40 years ago. Not anymore. How do we staff today? We are providing staffing based on the statistics, the average patient demand from the last year. But average patient demand does not exist. We have either above the uh, average patient demand or below. So the current staffing is a red bold line. And you can see that bed occupancy is either above or below. So what happened when it's above? It has been, there, be, uh, there are dozens of publications showing that when you have a peak above the red line, you have medical errors, readmissions, overcrowding, infections, mortality, 
and uh, nurses are stressed and exhausted. This is especially critical now during the pandemic. When we have a valley, what happened? Uh, if patient demand is less than we staff for, uh, we are wasting our resources. We cannot freeze those nursing resources to use for the next day. So we are jumping from stress to waste. Now, how the ideal healthcare system would look like? Imagine that all patients have the same disease with the same severity. That would be nice. Imagine that all of them arrive in the, at the same rate, like every 15 minutes you get a new patient. Moreover, imagine that all providers and nurses are equal in their brilliant ability to provide quality care. That would be a great system. That would be 100% efficiency Toyota product line. But we are not there. And we are not going to be there. Why? We have different types of stresses. We have natural variability with three components. Clinical variability. Our patients have different diseases, different severities, different responses to therapies. And uh, we cannot choose their diseases, unfortunately. Flow variability, they arrive to our emergency departments with broken legs, not when we want them to break their legs, but when they break their legs. Finally, professionally, uh, they are different in their inherent ability to provide quality care. So what are the qualities of this natural variability? They are random, cannot be eliminated or reduced, must be optimally managed. What does it mean optimally managed? It has been proven and demonstrated in many publications that homogenizing patient flow improves quality, reduces cost. We are doing that subconsciously. For example, how do we differentiate between clinical variability? We have different uh, uh, wards at the hospital. We have intensive care units, ICU. We have telemetry monitor beds, we have regular medical beds, we have regular surgical beds. So we are trying to homogenize the patient, but we don't know how far we should go with this homogenization. That's another very important question, multi-billion question, which is outside of the scope of our today's conversation. Just keep it in mind. How do we manage flow variability? Yes, we do. We separate a uh, random patient arrival to the emergency department from elective admission to surgery or uh, catheterization lab. Finally, we manage our professional variability, which certification, training, etc. So we are trying to take care of this natural variability, semi-intuitively, uh, I would say far from being optimal, but we are trying to do our best at least. Now, let me move to another subject. Uh, you probably have seen how the car manufacturers, they test the car. They hit the pothole versus high speed impact against the wall. Now, uh, try to remember what happened when you buy the first car for you or your parents buying the first car for you. What kind of car was it? Probably what, what kind of qualities of this car you were looking for? probably the one with a very thick bumper. Why? Because you or your parents knew that this car is going to be subjected to frequent stresses because you're an experienced driver. That's why. And we wanted the car like a tank with a very thick bumper. Now, what happened to our financial bumper today? It's practically disappeared. And let us look whether the stresses are intrinsic part of the health healthcare delivery. Maybe we can get rid of those stresses. What makes hospital census variable? In asking hospital CEOs for probably almost 20 years, why your hospital bed occupancy is so variable? I uh, rarely have answers. Frequently I see that in their eyes. God makes it this way. And our only challenge is to, uh, to find how to meet the demand. Let's drill deeper and figure out whether this is the case. Imagine this hospital. If EDK, emergency department cases are 50% of admission, elective surgical cases are 35% of admission. Again, elective schedule cases. 
So both of them, of these portals are responsible for 85% of all hospital admissions. The remaining are medical referrals, transfers, etc. Okay, that's our hypothetical hospital. Now, what would you expect to be largest source of census variability? Uh, one would say, if you ask stranger on the street or uh, any person with, you know, common sense, you'll say, of course, emergency department. First of all, there are more of them. And second, they are unpredictable by their nature. We cannot control patients coming to the ED. While elective surgical admissions, uh, are, there are fewer of them and we are in full control. So, but clearly, emergency should contribute more to the variability but not necessarily, because in a sense, our healthcare delivery is wonderland. And this fact has rarely, if ever, been recognized. I'm trying to be politically correct when saying that they have approximately equal effect. Normally, typically, the variability in the number of elective surgeries, I'm talking about pre-pandemic, don't forget, I'm not talking about pandemic yet. So pre-pandemic, we had uh, our uh, admission, uh, our, uh, the number of surgeries performed, surgical volume was more variable than the number of patients coming to our emergency department. Uh, in fact, uh, if you talk to your emergency department manager, just spend half an hour talking to your emergency department manager and ask pre-pandemic, were they able to predict how many patients would come today is Wednesday. How many patients would come typically on Wednesday for a given a season? Uh, short of the bus crash uh, or epidemic, they would tell you uh, exactly or, or approximately the number of patients that they admitted to their disease on Wednesday. They would tell you even the distribution of patient diagnosis. Short of the patient's last name, they will tell you everything. So why does it happen? because we have another type of variability. It's not random, not predictable, driven by a known individual priorities that should not be managed, must be identified and eliminated. And that's what we are going to talk about today. Just please look, please look at these two lines. One of them I can tell you, is the number of, that's a daily admission. One of them, and that's a real hospital, one of them is the number of patients admitted through the emergency department. Another one admitted for elective surgeries. Try to guess which one is which. You would have a hard time. Both of them seem to be extremely variable. Here is the answer. Our red line elective admissions are more variable than arrivals to the emergency department. That is the core of the most of the problem in our healthcare delivery. As long as we do not address it, we are going to lose human lives and we are going to waste billions of dollars. We call it artificial variability. Here is a study that you can download from our website you, uh, our website address is in the left bottom corner uh, of the screen, www.ihoptimize.org. That's a real study. That's a fragment from our publication in 2003 uh, uh, at the Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, we uh, analyzed what happened at the MICU, multidisciplinary ICU at that hospital where uh, the admissions were surgical and medical. Now, look at the blue line. The blue line is the number of surgical admissions, vast majority are elective, that seeking the bed at this ICU. The blue line. Look at the white line. That's a number of patients diverted or rejected from this ICU. Look, they almost coincide. You don't have a, to be a professor of statistics to see that. We found that over 70% of those rejections, the white line, would not take the place. The patient would be admitted if we only smooth elective schedule, if we would perform similar number of elective surgeries every day. 
at least for the weekdays. Now, think about the, one of the most scarce resources during the pandemic, it's ICU beds. You don't have enough ICU beds. How do we use them? Look at the screen, how do we use them? When we schedule our elective surgery the way we do, uh, we artif create an artificial deficit of ICU beds. Now, suppose that you have only one ICU bed and you have a patient from emergency department or elective so uh, on the left or elective surgery on the right. And you have to, you have only one ICU bed, you have two patients from the ED and uh, surgical patients equal uh, in terms of their acuity, both needs ICU bed. Who will get an ICU bed? Different countries have different criterions. Uh, many countries I know they give preference to the surgical patients because they bring a bigger cash flow. Other countries give uh, preference to the emergency patient. No matter whom you're given preference to, the problem is that you are not going to have bed for everybody who needs it. That's an issue. So how to solve this problem? You know, tomorrow probably we should put two patients in one bed. I don't know how to, else to do. So what uh, to do that? So what many hospitals did in the emergency department, they started, oh, our emergency department is overcrowded. Our emergency department is overcrowded because there is no ICU or floor beds. So what should we do? We should build more beds. We should build a bigger ED. So imagine that you have a fire uh, at the room and people are trying to leave the room. And what you do, you would still have narrow exit, but you will widen the entrance so more people would enter the room. That's what uh, building bigger ED would uh, do. Many years ago, one hospital CEO invited me to come to his hospital. He said, come to my hospital in two years, Eugene, and you will see how great is going to be our ED. We're increasing uh, its size. I'm investing 10 million in that. My answer was, how about you give me half of this money and you do nothing and both of us will benefit because first of all, you'll spend a lot of money. And second, you would exacerbate the problem because your ID will be even more overcrowded because the problem is exit from the ID, not ICU. No, sorry, not uh, the size of your ID. Okay, another study. I want to go free, uh, quickly through those, uh, uh, through those slides, uh, uh, but I would strongly recommend that you look uh, at them. It shows how uh, these peaks affect mortality, significant effect on mortality. And this is example for your homework. What would happen if you have a peak in terms of the patient mortality based on this publication? So please uh, uh, do that at home. I would strongly recommend you would understand what is going on and the uh, example is self-explanatory. Now, another more recent, it's already not recent, it's almost 10 years old, publication in New England Journal of Medicine, and that was the end of the story. Nobody is talking about patient mortality anymore because there was a clear cause was demonstrated in a large scale study there that when you have a peak, when your nurses are overloaded, when you have those peaks that we just discussed, uh, the mortality goes up significantly and the authors recommend to uh, reduce or eliminate those artificial peaks in patient demand in elective for elective admissions. Now, uh, what happened? Uh, you can look at this, uh, <laughs> that's an interesting website of the trial lawyers who put the link to this publication that I just showed to you in New England Journal of Medicine and says, you know what, if somebody dies at the hospital because of those peaks, please come to our place. So that's, so lawyers now uh, are looking at this. Another uh, very interesting study is that the hospital is, uh, the second lien, the hospital is being sued because the patient died due to, due to the overcrowding and understaffing. Understaffing and overcrowding is the same thing. It's just two sides of the same coin. Now, how can you staff? What are your options? There are only five. 
You can stuff at the peak 24 7 a big bed, bed occupancy. You don't have resources, funds to do it, so forget about it. Now, be creative in producing dynamic. A nursing pool that many hospitals do. So when you have a peak, you call nurse. We did a study, you can find it on our website, the formal study on the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant. And what we found by studying four hospitals, two community, two academic, uh, we found that those uh, bed this bed occupancy census fluctuating every half an hour to an hour. So there is absolutely no way you can have your nurses on time. So when you have a peak, you call on nurses, unless they live in the hallway, they would come when already the peak subsides uh, and you have a valley. So that's not a solution. In California, uh, in the United States, there is a de decision has been made to legislate nurses, to legislate nurse staffing, sorry. How do you do that? If you're a hospital CEO and you have this peak, either you have to go to the court for breaking the law or you have to divert some patients. Who would you divert? Either emergency or surgical patients, most likely emergency patients, at least in the US, because the surgical patients pay, pays better. So that's not a solution. Then uh, do what you do today. Preserve the status quo and do nothing. And tell nurses, well, we are very sympathetic to your life, you know, and in order to address this issue, we created nurse staffing committee. That's our way in healthcare to respond to every challenge, we create a committee. And in terms of the nurse staffing, the main outcomes of this committee that I've seen, at least in my experience, I don't want to, to talk, speak in general, at least in my experience, the main outcome of this committee is to schedule next meeting. So as long as you have those peaks and valleys, nothing would help. And finally, you smooth those peaks and valleys and that's a, uh, ch choice number five. That's it. There is no six options. These five covered everything. That's from my conversation uh, with the former president of the Joint Commission. That's the main organization of uh, certifying healthcare delivery organizations in the United States and internationally. Many of your countries, they have joint commission there. So you can see what happened. Sentinel events when patient dies or becoming personally uh, permanently injured depends on those peaks. When nurses are overloaded, here is what happened. You have 24% of sentinel events increase when the nurse is not trained sufficiently, and that's typical case because we have shortage of nurses in many countries, then up to 70% of death or permanent injuries comes from those peaks. Now, uh, 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 compliance with the safety requirements, again, are not realistic as long as we have those peaks. You may look at all those publications. How about variability in the healthcare associated infection? Again, the same thing, again and again and again. Those peaks are killing practically uh, patients and staff. Now, how about physicians' workload? Look at this very interesting study. Practically, it said that if you have the peak, then you have to start cloning your physicians because you have not enough. They are overloaded. And many of them report that they, 40% as far as I remember, they report that they have no resources to provide adequate care in 40% of time. That's huge. Now, how about readmissions? Again, if you want to reduce readmissions, forget about that if you have those peaks. That's one study. Here is another study. Again and again and again, we see the same. Now, many of you have rapid response team. Is it a good idea to have rapid response team? That's a team that is being launched when the patient deteriorates on the medical, let's say, or surgical floor. So they come from the ICU intensive care unit because they're better trained and they help to put patients on the track. Let's ask ourselves the question, why the patient deteriorates in the first case? In healthcare, it's always necessary to ask ourselves, why do we have the problem like with this Boeing? Why? Not just to try to solve it, but to analyze why do we have it in the first place? Why? So 
the patient deteriorates for two reasons. One reason that the patient is not provided adequate quality care. That's the main reason. And the second reason, because medicine, the patient could deteriorate without, uh, with no obvious reason, because the medicine is not mathematics and who knows why. So clearly the first reason that the patient is provided inadequate care is the main one. If the, uh, the hospital patient deteriorates and scars with no reason, then the hospital should be closed. So the patient deteriorates because the patient is not provided uh, adequate level of care and rapid response team comes and helps the patient. So why the patient is not provided adequate level of care? Because the patient is not being placed in the right bed with the right care, okay? Why the patient has not been placed in the right bed? Because we have a peak in elective admissions and experience bed shortage. Could you please, when you have a spare time, I would strongly encourage you, for those who are not familiar, to read the case on uh, lewisblackman.net. Lewis Blackman, one word, dot net. Please look at this and you will see what happened with teenage boy who after successful thoracic surgery and has been done on Thursday when most of the hospitals are overloaded, uh, uh, that he'd been placed there, deteriorated and died after successful surgery. So no way you can imp uh, improve your quality of care if your patients are misplaced. You can read more on our website here. Now, uh, variability methodology that again, you can read on our website more about, allow you to determine your hospital potential. Many hospitals are benchmarking themselves against another hospital across the street that is being screwed up. I don't understand why that should make you happy. You should figure out what is your potential and benchmark yourself about, uh, 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 benchmark yourself against your potential. Okay. Only when you smooth elective admissions, you can do that. Please look at the operating room at the starting point. Typically at the hospital operating room, I call it a Vatican. It's a state within a state. Uh, they do their scheduling regardless of what is going on at other parts of the hospital. Again, I don't have time to talk about everything, but it has been documented. More you can, you can read on our website. Uh, that it affects what is going on in radiology, finances, patient safety, and your, your staffing ratio, emergency department, radiology, even beyond the hospital uh, uh, walls, uh, long-term facility, rehabilitation and skilled nursing facility, strongly dependent on this schedule. Now, here are the choices you have. <clears throat> in the US, the, the capital cost per bed on East Coast is about a million and a half, and West Coast is three million. In your countries, uh, it's probably not that high, but trust me, it, it's pretty high. Now, now you uh, add more beds, nobody can afford it anymore, period, especially during the pandemic. Now, limiting the number of patients to accommodate, so rejecting the patient, that's not an option today. Also, during the pandemic, we started canceling elective surgeries, and that's drained the resources, uh, financial resources of the hospital. Elective patients, by the way, if you do not uh, admit them, if you do not do surgery, they may not be uh, 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 elective for a very long time. So they could become an origin. So cle clearly that's not a choice as well. Finally, smoothing those peaks and valleys are the solution. Now, uh, uh, you can read it later on. Those are the reasons why you should do that. And I bet you that uh, every hospital who participates in our today's session, a representative would find that at least one of those reasons uh, present at, uh, is present at your hospital. Now, uh, more it, it could be found in the book of the Joint Commission. Again, look at the front page on our website. Uh, but there are three phases of what needs to be done. The first is separating elective from uh, emergent surgery. The second, smoothing 
uh, on a daily basis, the number of surgeries that are coming to the same place, uh, same ward, I should say. For example, if you have orthopedic and general surgery coming to the same ward, the number of those uh, surgeries, uh, inpatient surgeries on daily basis should remain more or less the same. And finally, only then when you smooth, you can figure out what kind of resources do you need, kind of beds, staff beds, nurses. I indeed, uh, if uh, one day in your ICU pre-pandemic, there was a demand of five patients, another day 15, how many beds should you have? There is no answer to this question. So unless you smooth your elective surgeries, you, you, you cannot figure out how many staff beds, nurses or beds do you need. Now, here are a few studies that I would like to share with you. Again, that's pre-pandemic. Those are meta, uh, interventions and metrics. You can read it uh, on the screen. I don't want to, to repeat it. Now, interventions, those three phases that we just discussed. Look at the results. Boston Medical Center, only separation schedule and unscheduled resulted in huge improvement. At this place, uh, uh, 700 patients have been, uh, surgeries have, have been canceled or postponed, bumped due to those peaks. Once uh, they separated elective and, uh, uh, sorry, once separated uh, 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 so, uh, emergent and elective surgeries, they increased the uh, throughput by 10%. The bump surgeries move uh, or cancel move from 700 a year down to six in three years cumulatively. It, emergency waiting time dropped by 33%. And that's only phase one. Mayo Clinic phase one. Look at this. Uh, this hospital operating margin incre increased dramatically, cost saving. And this, at that point, there was 211 beds hospital. This is publication that you can find on uh, the American College of Surgeons publication. <clears throat> but look at another interesting thing. Please look at the staff turnover rate. That's number five bullet from the top. Nurses were leaving this place because they were stressed. Not anymore. The number of nurses leaving the place has been reduced by 43% because the stress had been reduced dramatically. It's not just for patients. It's not just for hospital product line, uh, sorry, for the uh, uh, bottom line. It's also for caregivers. That is very, very important. Another study at Johns Hopkins, you can see similar things. Here are the outcomes. Every single hospital that did this, implemented this at least partially, one of the faces, experienced multi-million saving. Every single one, annual savings, I should say. Another case, another hospital, they only did phase one, look at the results. Every single one. Now, my favorite one, Cincinnati Children's, they did two phases. They separated elective and emergent surgeries because they compete for the same resources. And they also uh, smooth the surgeries based on the destination, particularly in the ICU. Look at the results. Their waiting time for emergent surgeries dropped by one third approximately, despite the fact that the demand increased by one third. Overtime for surgeon had been reduced by 57%. That's huge because typically if what happened, if you have an elective schedule, then emergent surgery coming and elective is being postponed, bumped into overtime, which is not good for patient, not good for surgeons. So it's not, as we found, it's not good financially either. And that has been reduced by 57%. That is a byproduct of this smoothing, of the smoothing. So we cut the peaks and fill up the valleys in bed occupancy. That is another very important uh, thing. Now, patient satisfaction improved dramatically. And those who are interested in finances, 
look, they, when we started the project, they have uh, budgeted a new tower of 75 beds for 102 million, I believe. At the end of the project, they canceled it. They did not build a single bed. In addition to that, their uh, annual margin increased by one uh, by over 100 million a year. That's that's just one hospital. Now look how surgeons reacted to that. Maybe look, we improved the hospital operation, but surgeons hate it. That's a fragment from the Joint Commission Resources book of their chapter. Look at the surgeon's opinion. Everybody is happy. Patients are happy. Nurses are happy. Surgeons are happy. Hospital in Canada, the Ottawa Hospital, the similar results. The number of canceled surgeries has been eliminated completely. A mortality rate, they did a very interesting study. They found that the waiting for uh, emergent surgery results uh, in uh, increase significantly by 25% increased mortality. So when you separate elective surgeries from emergent surgeries, you perform them with different teams in different ORs, guess what happened? You get all this patient's life back. So they reported in the very first year, they reported 40 lives saved due to this intervention. In addition to that, just from the phase one, they save 9 million a year. So I can continue on and on and on. Uh, here is a, uh, we were talking about surgery. How about medicine? Do we do a good job with medicine? Not necessarily. <coughs> uh, uh, in medicine, we have a competition who is going to be placed in the bed. Uh, 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 and if the patient is diverted, we have some negative quality outcomes. Look at this study that has been done in three to four months. Uh, the hospital asked us how many beds do they need in addition to 90, 90 beds that they have already, uh, telemetry, monitor beds. So once we analyze the patient uh, placement criteria and help them to develop a universal one, look what happened. The number prior to that, they wanted to do that because the boarding time in the ED, the waiting time to get to telemetry bed at their hospital uh, was on average 15 hours, on average. So they wanted more beds. We showed them uh, how the uh, decision to, how to develop a patient placement criteria and consensus on that allowed them to reduce the number of beds rather than increase by 26. In this unit alone, they saved over 10 million per year. And guess what happened to the boarding time? It dropped from 15 hours down to, uh, uh, down to five. <coughs> down to three, forgive me. So it's five times 500% reduction. Now, how about outpatient clinic? Similar thing there. Again, you can read about that in this link. I don't have time to go into details, but outpatient clinic could do exactly the same. They, they were not able to accommodate the patients. They were rejecting the patients. Now see what happened. Uh, that's a fragment from their local newspaper. They invite patients to come. We did the same work statewide in New Jersey. And here are the outcomes. Again, that's a fragment from our website, the screenshot. You can uh, uh, go to our website and find much more information. Here are the outcomes, huge. Both in patient safety, financial access to care, you name it. So those are the uh, results of the existence of this flow variability. What should you do? What is here for patient? reduce waiting time, improve access to care, reduce mortality and medical errors. Nurses benefit from a significant reduction in workload and therefore uh, eliminating burnout. And uh, physicians reduce waiting time and hospital, etc., etc. I mean, everybody benefits, everybody. Now, there is a lot, many leading organizations in the US endorse this methodology. What is next? Now let's talk about post-pandemic. 
here is what you can do. You cannot afford that. Now, here is during the pandemic, recent publication, it's not published yet, but it's already on the website available. Uh, uh, that's already available on the website. Uh, look at this, that, look at the title. Whom should we treat, elective surgical patient or COVID? Because we want both and we can't uh, because of those peaks. So uh, please read it. Uh, you can download this uh, and you can read. They, they specifically argue that until you remove those peaks, nothing good would happen. Finally, this very, very successful study at the bottom uh, at the uh, uh, University, uh, University Health Network in Toronto, Canada. Uh, Toronto General Hospital is number one hospital in Canada and number four ranked in the world. Uh, coincidentally, we started working with them prior to pandemic. Nobody anticipated that, but they used it during the pandemic. And that allows them to significantly increase the number of emergent and urgent patients they, they were able to treat during the pandemic. And now they open the hospital for elective much sooner than, than others uh, in, in their province. So I would encourage you to look at these two coverages and you will see that while this recommendation was important pre-pandemic, now it is simply critical. Again, I would skip the uh, next few slides that uh, showing that I, uh, Institute of Medicine promote this, et cetera, et cetera. Resources. Please look at these two books. <clears throat> Again, you can purchase electronic versions from the uh, Joint Commission. Those are two books that I would strongly recommend you to look uh, if you want. And uh, on our website, even uh, look at the first link. Uh, no, actually, on the second link, you can read Louis Blackman's story. Just scroll down this file and you will read the story of this teenage boy. Now, uh, you have no choice but, but to do that. You need, uh, in order to succeed, you need data analysis, scientific management of operations, clinical and organizational behavior expertise. At this point, I would like to stop and open it for questions. Thank you so much, Eugene. What a presentation that really uh, there, there's, there doesn't seem to be any room for, for denying how brilliant this, this is and what a, an excellent solution this would be for nearly all hospitals at the moment, uh, especially during the pandemic. Uh, so thank you. And I'm delighted that we have a little bit of time left to go through some questions, if that's OK. Um, yeah. Great. So we have a question here. Um, what does it take to make these changes in thinking happen? And why isn't every hospital adopting these recommendations? What are your thoughts uh, on that? Yeah, uh, what it takes, I have to go to this screen again. Uh, that's a four legs tool. It's rigorous data analysis, scientific management of operation, clinical and operational behavior expertise. But there is one thing that is not on the screen and yet is the most important thing. And that's a hospital leadership. If the hospital uh, leadership is kind of, you know, going to inertia and the status quo, then nothing is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And as long as it's not happened, the hospitals will suffer. This pandemic, if there is any silver line in this pandemic, uh, uh, it is a fact that it shows all our inefficiency. It, it practically makes uh, this uh, absolute must uh, in, in terms for the hospitals to do that. Uh, let me be more specific. Now we have a good start. Uh, a few years ago, I, I would have to give you a long speech uh, answering this question. Now I would direct you to this book that has practically step-by-step -step recommendations of how to do that. Thank you, yeah. Um, now we have another question. Uh, how difficult is it to re-engineer the service? Very difficult. Mm. Uh, there is a 
I can tell you our experience that the main impediment to succeed, to success of that, uh, and that takes every time, huge amount of time for us, it's uh, collecting the right data. Again, read the book and uh, hospital culture that people do something today and they believe that simply because they were doing that for many years that's the way that it should be continued mm -hmm. so when you're trying to challenge it uh, you you feel the resistance every hospital every physician every nurse would tell you oh we need we need we cannot tolerate it anymore especially during the pandemic nurses are burned out the hospitals are losing money patients access is severely limited elective cases are becoming urgent and cannot get access in this link to the study covered by cbc that i just showed you somewhere yeah i don't know where, where did i put it yeah i don't know uh, but I, I just showed you yeah and the down, uh, this bottom yeah. link yeah uh, th that that's an interview even with a patient whose uh, uh, elective case became became an uh, urgent case. Mm. Uh, but when it comes to the change, <clears throat> then you see the resistance, and that's a perfect illustration of the Einstein's definition of insanity. You want to continue the same thing and get a different outcome. You want. Um, and uh, do you have any recommendations for ways to get surgeons on board with this kind of thing, just in terms of separating the elective from the emergency? Um, do you, I, I understand you experience pushback. Any recommendations for getting them on board? Education. Mm. I can tell you if needed, uh, if uh, I ask you, if you guys are willing to support it, we may have another webinar just for surgeons, anesthesia explaining why uh, i strongly believe uh, that that's a matter of education we have on our website you can find multiple hospitals that did it just look at the success stories and roi yeah. uh, on our website you'll find it uh, and uh, the surgeons when they sh show the data they listen and they would do it the main problem uh, that when I started my journey in this area over 20 years ago already, I truly believe that the surgeons are main obstacle in doing that. They are not. The, the main obstacle is administration. If surgeons are being shown the data uh, and hear from their colleagues from other places who have done it, they would follow. Yeah, great. Um, uh, I have a question here as well from Akio uh, in Japan. So he's asking uh, how should how and where we should start the change. Uh, should we start from the top or from the front lines? And from the, from the top. From the top. Okay. Immediately, because what would happen as soon as you start making changes without getting your hospital CEO on board? These people who do not like the change, they would run to the hospital CEO and say, oh, you know, they are ruining my business, ruining my business, I'll go somewhere else, etc. Your CEO should be on board. If there is a need, again, for another session to educate hospital CEOs, our institute would be happy to provide it. But the hospital CEO is definitely starting point. Excellent, thank you. Um, and another another interesting uh, question is, can this be applied to primary care as well? Yeah, I just demonstrated that. Unfortunately, okay. I do, uh, didn't have enough time oh, so okay. uh, to cover that. But please, yeah. uh, here is the results. That's a primary care. And uh, look at these results. The first one is a coverage in a local newspaper, but the second link is the two interviews a short if you don't have time and the long one of the hospital ceo sorry not hospital ceo forgive me uh, the president of this uh, community health center and that's a safety net chain that's the main safety net in the u.s during hurricane katrina that saved patient and they 
they serve, they, they don't have money, they serve under and uh, 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 and uh, underinsured and uninsured population. So they, they cannot get money, the only their hope was efficiency. So he will tell you how we, they started this project, they called us and he will tell you uh, in details, very interesting CEO, he will tell you in details about how they've done it. Yes. It, it has been done in the in patient outpatient clinic. It has been done even with the hospital within the hospital at cancer's clinic as well. Mm, okay, great. That's that's great to hear. Um, uh, and I might just get to a last question um, uh, about lower income countries. So, is there? Do you think that this is also applicable to to services in lower income countries where there is a lot of acute demand? Uh, in low income countries it's more important than in high income countries because what we were doing in the us we were throwing money at the problems for a very long time so if you have a peak uh, let's let's build more beds uh, uh, the low income countries cannot afford them for them to be inefficient is simply not affordable today i have to say due to the pandemic all the countries slowly transferred into low income because uh, our healthcare uh, uh, funds practically evaporated. So all of us are in the same boat and we just must to do it. It demonstrated to save multiple, I would say thousand human lives and a lot of money. Just one last example, in 2012, <clears throat> again, you can find it, <clears throat> excuse me, on our website, there were two leading U.S. health policy experts from Berkeley University and Stanford, Dr. Milstein and Shortell. They demonstrated that if all the hospitals in the U.S. would implement that, that would result in four to five percent reduction in the in the overall U.S. healthcare cost, which is about between 150 and 180 billion a year. Mm. So, so uh, that is uh, obviously it is a must. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Well, we're just we're just at the hour now, so um, I'm uh, kind of sad to wrap up because I think we could probably talk to you for a lot longer, Eugene. Um, so I want to say a massive thanks to you first of all, and that was a really interesting. Uh, webinar. Uh, we've had lots of feedback here in the comments about how great it was, how interesting and informative. Um, and somebody also said it's one of the best ever. So um, thank you so much for that. Could you, could you please, uh, your, your audio taping it, right? Yeah, it's being recorded. Yeah. Uh, so because I just, I just want to show it to my wife so she believes that I'm doing something <laughs> useful. <laughs> no problem. We have the proof. We have the proof. <laughs> So I say again, uh, 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 if you uh, uh, will have a question and you can summarize them and say, I, I cannot promise answering every question, but uh, uh, some of them probably my colleagues and I would try to answer. Excellent. Thank you. So if anyone has questions, uh, as Eugene said, if you want, you can send them on to me uh, or to fellowship at isqua.org and um, I can coll collate them and send them on to Eugene. Uh, also, I will send any anyone who registered, I'll send the link to the recording when it's finished. Um, and uh, the, also the links that you've mentioned to the um, to the books, I'll send I'll send them out to um, the link to the website you mentioned. Um, uh, and uh, any other resources, um, I think I can signpost them to your website as well, can't I? Yeah, it's a lot on our website. You can find much more. Uh, then I can do it within an hour. And I just want to mm. thank you guys for organizing this webinar. Uh, Our pleasure. I think it is one of the most critical issues now during the pandemic. And you, you, I really appreciate you disseminating this information. Absolutely. Uh, you were more than welcome. It was an absolute pleasure. Uh, and as I said, very informative. Um, and yeah, I think we might have a lot more, um, a lot more interest in this topic. And as you mentioned, you might, you might come back sometime and just talk to surgeons. Uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, so we can be in touch about that and hopefully we might have a follow-up someday. We'd be happy to. 
lovely okay thank you very much eugene take care and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and give our greetings to your wife <laughs> uh, thank you thank you thanks eugene thank you thank you thanks bye everybody thank you bye bye